On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. And welcome to the About Books podcast and program. In this episode, it's an update on what's going on in the publishing world and a look at some new books being published. We'll also introduce you to Keith Urban. He's the president of a literary agency, and we'll find out exactly what that is and what he does. But first, let's start with this week's publishing industry news. Now, a recent Axios report looks at the rise in challenged and banned books in public school libraries. According to the American Library Association, there were over 300 challenges to books in school libraries in just three months last year. That eclipsed the 156 challenges in all of 2020. Now, one of the most targeted titles has been Alex Gino's novel about a transgender girl. It's entitled George. Retired Texas librarian Carolyn Foote told Axios, quote, we might have one big challenge like every two years, I have to say that what we are seeing is really unprecedented. Also in the news, Hunter Biden's ex-wife is writing about her life and the end of her marriage due to what she says was Mr. Biden's substance abuse and infidelity. The book is entitled If We Break. It's being published by Crown and will be available in June. Also in the news, author and critic Terry Teachout died recently at the age of 65. He was a regular theater and arts columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and he was also the author of numerous books, including biographies of H.L. Mencken, Louis Armstrong, and Duke Ellington. And in more news, former Attorney General William Barr is publishing a memoir of his time as Attorney General in both the Trump and George H.W. Bush administrations. Its title, One Damn Thing After Another, and it will be on sale March 8th. Now, according to the NPD book scan, print book sales got off to a rocky start for the new year, down close to 14% for the week ending January 8th. Now, this could be a post-holiday slump, a reminder that 40% of all books are sold during the holiday period. Well, what do Donald Rumsfeld, Senator Tom Cotton, Donna Brazil, and John Boehner all have in common? We'll give you one answer. And that's that they've all worked with the Javelin Literary Agency here in Washington, D.C. The president of that organization joins us now on About Books, Keith Urban. Mr. Urban, when did you start Javelin, and is it fair to call it a literary agency at this point? It is, Peter. We're uh, one of the the literary agencies here in D.C. We started, it's my partner, Matt Latimer, and I did 10 years ago, uh, just over that, we celebrated our uh, 10th anniversary uh, last fall. Uh, and we've been, uh, we love what we do. And it, it's fun to to work with authors, some of them you named. Uh, I think we've worked with about 150 authors at this point in 10 years. Um, and uh, I like to think we have the funnest job in, in Washington, D.C. with just all the conversations we have, all the intelligence we're hearing. It's just, it's a, it's a fun job to be at the intersection of publishing, and media, uh, and politics. It's, it's, uh, it's a joy. Well, Mr. Urban, what does a literary agent do? Well, we are, um, well, I an uncharitable way of putting it would be mercenaries. We're uh, sort of the middlemen between authors and publishers, and we try to get our authors uh, the best possible deal, which is usually in the form of an advance from, uh, from publishers. And, and uh, you know, most of them are based in New York, the, the publishers. There are five big ones, HarperCollins, Simon Schuster, Macmillan, uh, Shet. Uh, and we work to uh, work, work with our authors to come up with book proposals, basically the ideas for books. And then we go out and sell them. And, uh, you know, what makes us a little different as agents from a lot of people in the industry is, you know, my background, um, as you alluded to, is, uh, as a writer. I was a, a Pentagon speechwriter for a number of years, as was uh, my partner, who's uh, a speechwriter as well, um, uh, as well as for the president. And, you know, so we work with our authors to sort of come up with book ideas and help sharpen uh, those ideas to, mo- to the most commercial uh, 
uh, idea possible. And then we work with them to help, in some cases, help them write the book. Um, and then we have a whole pub- in-house publicity team that works with our authors and the, the publishers to get the word out about those books. So we're pretty aggressive. And if we work with us, um, you know, chances are you'll read about it or hear about it somewhere in the media, including um, on C-SPAN, as many of our authors have done over the years. So isn't that something, though, that a publisher does as well? You know, it is. I do think, you know, and particularly in this day and age, um, editors are overworked. A lot of them are editing 20, 30 books a year and uh, 30, 20, 30 books a year. And, um, you know, publicity teams are overworked. So I think it helps our authors to have that additional support, both on the editorial side, as well as with publicity. And, you know, being in Washington and working with a lot of journalists, I think, um, you know, we tend to be trusted with, with uh, you know, some of the most interesting books and, and uh, exclusive interviews. And so when we, we work with our authors, we really try to pull out all the stops to make sure that, um, you know, that book is, is received well and heard about. And, you know, I think a complaint you'll hear from many who've written books over the last decade is that there's, there's not enough support given by publishers to um, to the publicity side of it, as well as to the editorial. And so I think just having those extra sets of eyes and hands to help support an author ends up making a big difference. So we try to do that uh, as a value add at Javelin. Well, Keith Urban, one of the truths, I think, about the publishing industry is that it's 80% left of center, and you don't come at it from that point of view. Is that correct? Well, you know, I, I try to leave my politics out of it. I mean, it's true that I worked in um, Republican politics for a number of years, um, the Defense Department and in the United States Senate. Um, but, you know, I work with authors left, right, and center. And, and you know, I view my job as um, being their advocate. And I don't have to agree with all of my authors 100% of the time. And I think, you know, we're an agency that supports free expression and, um, you know, works with a wide range uh, of, of authors. Um, and so, you know, I try to leave my, my politics outside of it whenever I'm, I'm working with an author. Um, I think for, for some of our authors on the left who, and who are Democrats, I think it helps sometimes to anticipate some of the questions and, and um, you know, uh, objections that they might get from the right. And, and conversely, working with conservatives and, and um, which is, you know, where we started our company. We work with a lot of conservatives. We were one of the only agencies in the business uh, that was um, working uh, with folks out of Republican politics. Um, and since then, we've grown and, and really work with, with all sides as well as some of the best journalists in the world, which we're, we're really proud to, to do. Have you ever turned down an author? Yes, many times. In fact, we do it, you know, I'm for, for many reasons. Sometimes it's uh, because it's, you know, politics, but more often, you know, just business of being an agent is that, uh, you know, we get, you know, probably a dozen to 20 proposals a week and very rarely do we end up taking them on. Um, you know, it, for, and, and there are lots of reasons to do that, but we end up saying no far, far more often than we say yes. Keith Urban, one of the high profile authors that you did represent after he was fired from the FBI was James Comey. What was that process like? Well, um, you know, James Comey is one of the, the first major authors uh, in, in sort of the political sphere um, who was not coming out of Republican or conservative circles. So he was um, in many ways uh, a, f- uh, a formative client for us. Uh, we pitched him out of the blue um, and my partner really deserves the credit for that. Um, and, you know, after a, a couple email exchanges where he insisted that he wouldn't wasn't interested in writing a book. We were able to get an in-person meeting and, and, you know, I think we were able to convince him that getting his side of the story out there would be a real service to the country and a real service to history. Um, and a higher loyalty ended up being a number one New York times bestseller for, for weeks on end. Um, and one of the best selling political books of the last decade. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a privilege to work with him. He's, he was, uh, he's, he's a, he's a great man. How much editorial input did you have into his book? Well, like, well, like a lot of authors, we, we worked pretty hands-on with him, and he delivered a complete first draft about the help of any writer or collaborator, which is pretty rare for someone who's been in public office um, that long. Uh, he's a lawyer, um, so he actually was, a, was quite a gifted writer, but I think as he would tell you, we, we spent some time with him 
uh, reorganizing was mostly structural, um, helping him pull out more of a narrative, uh, showing more than telling. Uh, and we worked with him over, uh, you know, probably two, three weeks, just crashing on that manuscript and getting it to the best possible shape and making sure that that sort of the storytelling, um, really, uh, really shined through. And I think, um, you know, the success of that book, the reviews of the book, uh, bore that out. I'm, 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 I'm proud of, uh, I'm proud of, I'm really proud of that book. Mr. Urban, profiles have been written about Javelin and yourself and Matt Latimer in The Washingtonian, The New York Times Magazine, and the word ghostwriter has come up in both of those profiles. Is that something that Javelin offers to its clients? You know, I would say for some of our authors, they do end up hiring ghostwriters. Um, back when we started, we really did a lot more of that. Um, in-house, meaning, you know, offer that editorial support. Um, you know, our business has grown so much over the last decade that we rarely do that anymore. Um, you know, we have a stable of, of writers and researchers that we work with and connect authors with. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not surprising that, um, you know, folks that have been in public office or have been CEOs um, need writing assistance from time to time. A lot of books are that way. And I think as long as you... Um, disclose that in the acknowledgments and say, you know, how a book was produced. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's well above board. And so, you know, at Javelin, our job is to produce the best possible book. And, and for people who aren't born writers or, or um, you know, storytellers, uh, sometimes it helps to, to bring in um, some, some editorial support, whether that's in the form of a, a full ghost writer or collaborator or, or an editorial assistant, an extra set of eyes. Mr. Urban, you were quoted in the New York Times profile as saying, books still have a cultural weight. What were you referring to? Well, I, I think there's something important about holding a book and, and a physical book. And for, you know, a long time, um, you know, in the, in the mid-2000s, there were a lot of obituaries written from the publishing industry. E-books are going to take over and, you know, the physical print book is dead. And I don't think that's true. Um, and it's certainly not been borne out in our experience. And I, I, I think, you know, when you, when you have a book and, and meaning you know, 60, 100,000 words printed between two bound covers, um, it conveys authority, it conveys gravitas, allows you to go out and talk to media, um, do podcasts. And, and, you know, I think sometimes the, 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 the medium through which you, you people hear about books and, learn about books and decide to buy a book changes over time. I think publishing um, in, in terms of the traditional book industry is strong. Certainly the, the COVID era um, has borne that out. I think, you know, the publishing industry profits are up. People were, were left with more times of time on their hands and, and, and reading at home more than they have been before. Um, so I think publishing is far from dead. I think it's, you know, it's, it's best years, uh, they may be now, and I, I think they, they may be uh, for some years in the future. Has technology changed the publisher, author, agent, publicity model in the last couple of years? I don't think technology or anything in publishing has really changed, you know, how important publicity is. Again, I think, you know, podcasts are, a, a, you know, now a very good vehicle and sort of the long form interview as opposed to, you know, the network morning shows or, or some of the, the ways that, you know, 10, 20 years ago were really the primary vehicles to, to, to book publicity. And I think now um, there, there are a lot more avenues to getting the word out about a book um, than there were before. And I think some of them are, are very successful. I will say one thing that's changed sort of technology wise in publishing is sort of the advent of eBooks and instantly downloadable on your iPhone into your car, uh, being able to hear an author uh, read a book as opposed to, you know, you sitting down in a chair and, and I, you know, on a Kindle or, or a physical copy, the, the, the explosion in audio books um, has, has been something that that's, that's been, a, you know, I don't think a lot of people were predicting a decade ago. Keith Urban here in Washington, we've all been exposed to the, to the revelation, to the newspaper article in the Washington Post or somewhere. That's an excerpt from a book. 
How important is that revelation, that shock moment in a book? You know, it depends on the kind of book. If, um, you know, we would do a lot of history, do a lot of pop science. Um, we do things outside of politics that don't need a big flashy excerpt or, you know, a, a, a push notification via the Washington Post that this bombshell book is now out or, you know, something on the, the Drudge Report. Um, I think it's more important for political books to have that kind of coverage and, and sort of sequencing, um, you know, a publicity campaign so that parts of the book come out you know, when the author and, and when the publisher wants it to, rather than having it leak out, which happens, you know, particularly on these highly anticipated political books, you know, oftentimes the guardian will get a copy early and, and sort of disgorge all the contents, all the, 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 the newsy tidbits out there. And I, and when that happens, I think it, 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 you know, authors aren't, aren't generally happy. So we try to get ahead of that and plan in advance, um, working with different reporters and journalists who are interested in the subject matter to, to get the book out and point them to passages that they'll find interesting and that, 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 um, you know, a general audience will find uh, interesting. So I, I think it's very important that you, you, you know, that there's sort of strategic rollout and that, um, you know, that media is a big part of it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the guardian because it does seem that the guardian newspaper out of London gets advanced copies of a lot of these books and can excerpt them and bring the shock value uh, to light. How do you think that happens? You know, I don't know. Um, someone did a profile of, I think, the, the journalist who gets a lot of them. Um, and, you know, it's anyone's guess as to how The Guardian gets advanced copies, but I know it's a uh, it's a big thorn in the backside of publishers and um, you know, we plan, we plan rollouts around it and we try to game out when we think the guardian um, is going to get an advanced copy. And, and um, you know, sometimes we work that into our plan. Sometimes we, we try to preempt it, but um, you know, it's, it's a big mystery. I don't know, but kudos to them. They obviously have um, you know, a system that, that works. Publishers work really hard in some cases like we did in, with the Comey book, we kept it under lock and key for weeks and we were able to hold that secret, um, you know, a long time, uh, up until the Thursday, Friday before publication. So four days before, um, and we, you know, if, if a book is contains truly explosive material, um, publishers will go to extreme lengths to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, the, the embargo holds as long as possible and that folks like the guardian don't get it two weeks early, which sometimes they do. Keith Urban, I want to ask you a question about putting an author on tour. Here at Book TV, we get most every nonfiction author that uh, you can possibly imagine. We find an event or an interview or something. But with President Biden's book prior to running for office, Promises to Keep, we could not get an event because it was being sponsored by Live Nation and they would Mm -hmm. not let cameras in. Is this a new model? You know, I think it's been a model that's been tried. I know President Biden with that book, you know, he he partnered with, you know, made a big sort of corporate uh, deal uh, with Live Nation to do book events around the country. I don't know how successful it was from a profits perspective. I think their competing interests with with a book rollout, I'm sure that, um, you know, that reality was frustrating to the, the publisher of that book, not being able to do, you know, um, an event, a broadcast event with book TV, which in our experience, and I think in, in pretty much everyone's experience is one of the, 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 you know, the tried and true outlets to reach uh, a book buying audience uh, in, in any, in any form of media. And I think, um, you know, I, I think that was sort of more of a one-off. I, I think in the COVID era, sort of that live events business, Um, has taken a big hit and may come back um, in the future as we start to do more and more things in person again. Um, But I have not, you know, I've not heard of a lot of examples in the last two, three years of, um, you know, sort of the live event as book selling opportunities um, be be a big part of the business. I I think if anything, it's declined substantially. Has the pandemic hurt authors trying to get out on tour? I think it is, it's, the pandemic has certainly changed the way authors promote books and where we used to do 10, 15 city tours around the country and, 
you know, bundle 500,000 books at each event. That hasn't happened. And so I think it's put more of a premium on earned media and doing, you know, sort of more remote interviews to reach audiences. You know, there was a period early on in the pandemic when people were doing, you know, um, book events by Zoom. And I think, you know, enthusiasm for those quickly waned. Those did not end up being particularly successful for authors and selling books. Um, so, you know, I'd say in the last six months, um, you know, since the summer, I think uh, Omicron has, has changed, changed it and people are dialed back the, the in-person events again. Um, but I'm not sure that that's going to continue. We'll see. Um, but I do think just not, not being able to go out and be with an audience speaking in person, um, it's been harder, but people are still able to find books. You know, it's, you know, I think the pandemic has certainly cemented Amazon's, you know, status as the, the dominant player in terms of retail sales and, and people being able to, with a click of a button, have books delivered to their doorstep. Um, that's just how people buy books these days. And it's, it's a reality of life in 2022. Keith Urban, what are the advantages and perhaps disadvantages of being located in Washington and not the publishing center of the world, New York City? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think this was an underserved market before we started, you know, we started Javelin in terms of just America has a fascination with politics and what goes on in the city. And, you know, I think we've been able, part of the reason we've been successful is we've tapped into that and we work with authors who have interesting things to say that people want to hear. And so there was, I think, a void um, here in terms of publishing and helping authors think through books uh, before we started. Certainly there's some, some good agents um, in DC, but I think um, we've helped sort of tell the story of journalists and political figures and, and people here. I think one of the, the limits is, you know, a lot of our colleagues um, who are editors that we work day to day, they are in New York, although for the last two years, very few of them have even been back in their offices. So they're all working remote. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we would uh, travel up to New York every month to do author meetings, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, and we haven't, we haven't done that since. We haven't, we haven't needed to since everyone's sort of working remotely and publishing succeeded um, in, you know, making the remote model of, of work um, succeed. And so, um, you know, I think, I think one challenge that we have is for a lot of our authors who are maybe not in politics or not journalists convincing them that, that we, you know, have a, um, you know, a broader repertoire and, and, you know, record of New York times bestsellers beyond politics is, is, you know, that's a conversation we have a lot. Um, but, you know, we, we diversified our list and have had, uh, hundreds of books over the last decade, uh, about a hundred, 180, 200 books now, uh, many dozens of which have nothing to do with politics. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it gives us a, it, it, it serves a, you know, Washington market in a big way, being here and being able to do in-person meetings. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to keep building our list and keep doing things beyond politics as well as within it. Well, Robert Barnett is considered the godfather of, uh, literary agents here in Washington, the lawyer with Williams and Connolly. Is he a competitor? Well, look, I, I worked with Bob. You know, the first book I did was when I was working with Secretary Rumsfeld, and, and we worked with Bob together. And, and um, you know, Bob has been very successful and built up a, a, a great business um, over the last uh, couple decades. And um, you know, I think he has the record for what is you know probably the biggest nonfiction deal in, in history with uh, Michelle and Barack Obama. And so, you know, he's a formidable figure. He's very good at what he does. Um, you know. I, I, I have all the respect in the world for him. So is he a competitor? I think there's some books that, you know, we, you know, we, we, we pitch authors together and, and uh, we win some and he wins some. Well, if you've listened to us to the last, for the last 20 minutes, you've heard the name Javelin as the name of this literary agency. Where did that come from? Um, interesting story, Peter. It was, uh, uh, it's actually an homage to, um, Matt, my partner, and, and I, our, our, our mentor, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, his uh, wife's Secret Service name, Joyce Rumsfeld, uh, was Javelin. And we, uh, we admired her, got to know her very well over the years. And uh, we, decided, we thought it was a catchy name. It 
didn't sound like another Washington cliche. And, and so we decided to go with it. And for whatever reason, it's stuck. And that's how we're known. And uh, we're proud to be associated with Joyce Rumsfeld. Keith Urban is the president and founding partner of the Javelin Literary Agency. We appreciate you joining us on About Books. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. And this is About Books. This is Book TV's look at the latest publishing news and nonfiction books. Here are some books being published this week. In South to America, Princeton University African American Studies professor and native Alabaman Imani Perry provides a history of America through her travels in the South. Nobel Prize winning economist Amarta Sen reflects on his life in the places he's called home, which include India, Bangladesh, and England. His memoir, Home in the World. And in The Economic Weapon, Cornell University professor Nicholas Boulder looks at the use of economic sanctions in times of war and peace. And also being published this week, New York University philosophy and neuroscience professor David Chalmers weighs in on our technological future and what it means to live in a virtual world. His book is called Reality Plus. And in Savage Journey, Peter Richardson looks at the writing life of Hunter S. Thompson from his early influences to his embrace of so-called gonzo journalism. Well, another new book that is just out is by theoretical physicist Leonard Malodna. He's appearing on our author interview program afterwards this weekend to talk about the advances in the study of emotion in the fields of psychology and neuroscience. Here's a preview. Emotions play a important, vital role, I argue, uh, in, in your everyday life, even in, not maybe always moment to moment, unless you're talking about core affect, but, but emotional, uh, emotional experiences happen much more often probably than people think about. It's not just when you get really angry at that driver who cut you off, that you're, that's not the only time in the day that you're feeling emotion. You're, you're feeling it in much more subtle and everyday uh, normal situations and, and, and all through the day, and they, they and your emotions are what prompt you to do much, take much many of your actions. If you had no feelings at all, if you were just a robot with no feelings, when I was on <laughs> Star Trek: The Next Generation, that was what Data was supposed to be. At least Spock was half human, but Data was purely, uh, un, you know, unemotional. Uh, what 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 would cause you to even do anything? You you wouldn't you have no desire, no goals, no enjoyment, no joy. So why would you get up off your chair? You know, unless your program specifically said at nine o'clock, get up and go make coffee or whatever it is that, you know, our current robots do, but it would never initiate action on its own other than what was programmed into it. So I argue that I talk about how that works and, and how emotion is, is, is really vital. But let me say one other thing, and I know that you, you'll agree, I, I believe you'll agree with this, and it's an important point. I want to make clear that I talk about the emotional uh, emotion and rational thinking. Uh, and I don't mean by, I, I, I say that these are inextricable, that they are, not only is emotion not counterproductive, but there's no such thing as a purely logical, rational processing in your brain that it all happens together and it works together. And I talk about how, how that happens. And that was Leonard Mladenow discussing his latest book, Emotional, on Book TV's Afterwards program. A reminder that Afterwards airs every Sunday on Book TV and is also a podcast available at C-SPAN Now or wherever you get your podcasts. Finally, here's a look at some of the best-selling books according to the Los Angeles Times. Topping the list is Michelle Zahner's memoir, Crying in h Bart. That's followed by University of Houston professor Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. It's about making meaningful human connections. After that, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones looks at American history and slavery's legacy in present day America. Then it's My Body, model and actress Emily Ratajkowski's thoughts on feminism and beauty. And wrapping up our look at the Los Angeles Times best-selling nonfiction books is comedian Mel Brooks' memoir, All About Me. And that's this week's publishing news and the latest nonfiction books. Thanks for joining us on the About Books program and podcast. A reminder that this is available as a podcast at C-SPAN Now, which is C-SPAN's app, 
or wherever you get your podcast.